magic is always in the people the magic is always in the connection mm -hmm. and how you make people feel when they come and stay with you is where the real magic lies and i think that is the unique fabric for airbnb i would say mm -hmm. so in india again the whole piece around bollywood cricket works yeah. right mm -hmm. uh, because there is massive fan following in terms of understanding what your favorite cricketer is doing or what your favorite star is doing and people are very interested in their lifestyles right so at any point of time we had almost 70 to 80 people in different cities across india wow. you know in neighborhoods in a coffee shop talking to 10 people and wow. explaining what airbnb is and what the benefits of the platform are right what it led to was it created interest in the host community to kind of list their spaces on the platform yeah and these teams that we would call, you know, um, the, the, the hosting teams on the ground would be in the market for, say, two months. Welcome to the Indian Silicon Valley podcast. I'm your host, Jivraj. And today I have with me a very special guest. Join me in welcoming Amanpreet Singh Bajaj, who is the India head and Southeast Asia head of Airbnb. Thank you so much, Amanpreet, for joining me. Very glad to be hosting you. Hi, Jivraj. Thanks for having me. Great to hear that, Amanpreet. And I've had the pleasure of knowing you outside of these recordings and in inner circles. So I know that you're a very, very sharp operator with some incredible insights. You've seen the ecosystem from you know, the 2010s uh, and you built a company then. Then you joined Airbnb at a time where it was not very obvious, right? Not many people could be in 2013 uh, pinpoint that Airbnb would be the massive success it is. Mm. So I want to start off by understanding some of your life decisions. How does somebody who went to EY to work a uh, startup at a time when it was, again, not very cool, very risky, uh, exit that company to uh, Flipkart, yes. yes, and then join Airbnb. These are all very radically interesting choices mm -hmm. that I want to understand your mindset about, mm -hmm. and then we can dive deeper into some of those bits. That's a very interesting question. So maybe I'll just zoom out and say how my career has kind of spanned, right? Please. Uh, so yeah, you're very right. Um, from an education perspective, I'm a bachelor's in information technology. Um, this was from the University of Delhi. Um, four years, kind of spent a lot of time understanding different technologies. One thing that became very clear during that period for me was that I was not meant for coding. Mm -hmm. I just could not do it, right? <laughs> but what happened during that time was that I was exposed to this magnificent world of internet. Okay. Um, I still remember at that time, you know, we would go to the college lab, switch on the computer, and spend about 10, 15 minutes browsing the internet. And I'm talking about the times when Yahoo was big. Is you know, Richard, ICQ. 2004, This five? would be 2000, not even 2000, like literally 2000, um, wow. uh, early 2000, 2000, 2001, 2003. Right. And uh, this was when you had to connect through a modem and, and kind of, you know, very different to how you access internet today. Right. Uh, but it kind of drew me towards itself. In fact, during my undergrad days, I teamed up with a couple of guys mm -hmm. and we started a youth portal at that point of time. It was called YankeeDelhi.com. <laughs> the idea was to create a community around Delhi because that is what we understood we lived here. Um, and uh, everything that you feed, see today, like for example, social media, um, you know, forums to kind of discuss uh, ongoing issues or even just to understand what's happening in your neighborhood, we had all of this built into this portal. Oh, wow. The revenue model for this portal was just to get Google to pay us for every search that used to happen on our platform. So I still remember we earned our first check of about $14, $15, and we were like on top of the world. But it kind of introduced to us what the internet could do in terms of you know disseminating information, in terms of creating communities, in terms right. of uh, creating dialogue within communities that had an impact. Um, as life took its own turn, obviously from my college, I went on to take up a job with American Express to start with, uh, spend about a year with them. And then during that period, I understood that to grow in the corporate ladder, you needed an understanding of business dynamics and et cetera, right? And so that pushed me towards getting an MBA. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to stay in Delhi for some personal reasons. And so um, I decided to go to a, an, a B school in Delhi itself. During B school, I interned with EY. Um, I was very entrepreneurial also during my school days, yeah. uh, the B school days. Uh, but B school, EY came to campus, they liked me, I liked them, and I did my first summer internship with them. Yeah. Now, this was a life changing moment um, because you get introduced to a very different world of, you know, the, the consulting world, I would say. Yeah. So I still remember day one, I was part of a team which was doing risk management for a large pharmaceutical company in India. 
And uh, my manager at that point of time said, okay, today morning we're going to go and meet the CEO. And I'm right there the next, after one and a half hours, in a cabin of one of the largest manufacturing uh, pharmaceutical companies in India, and they're having a dialogue on what are the key risks to the business. Mm -hmm. The next hour, we were in a warehouse in, for the same company, but talking to the storekeeper, understanding business at that level. And I thought this was fascinating. Where else would you get the training to kind of understand a business from its business activities straight to the boardroom strategy, right? Yeah. So I loved doing it. Thankfully, they loved me in terms of what I did, and they offered me a pre-placement offer. Mm -hmm. And I joined EY as a consultant. Um, when I joined EY as a consultant, my tech background was something that I wanted to kind of leverage. So very early on, I started uh, you know, working on projects that created tools for EY uh, that would then be deployed on the various consult the client sites. Yeah. Um, primarily focused on compliance, control, et cetera, because that was a domain that I was working on. Again, a lot of fun kind of building things from scratch, uh, IT tools, and then eventually deploying them at various clients and getting the feedback loop, et cetera. During EY, I still remember I had a very good first year, right? And um, my manager at that point of time, someone who's had a very deep impact in the way my career has shaped, came to me and said, okay, this is the salary there is, and this is the bonus, and you've got the best rating, et cetera. What else do you want, right? Because I really would like to do more for you. Yeah. And at, by that time, you know, one thing was very clear, that consulting obviously was great, but I wanted to get an exposure to the overseas world. Right. And you know, and I, very naively, I'd never been abroad. I, I think at that point, I didn't even have a passport. Mm -hmm. You know, and I told my boss, his name was Rahul. Um, you know, and I said, Rahul, I would love to be part of an overseas project. Mm. He laughed. Within <laughs> 20 minutes, I was put on a project uh, which was in the U.S. again, oh, wow. um, in a in a pharmaceutical domain, um, and that was my first time that I traveled to the U.S. on a uh, consulting gig. What started there was a journey where over the next four years. I would spend almost 200 to 225 days a year overseas, uh, working on various industries, various countries. So I had the pleasure to work and the, the luck to kind of work on you know, multicultural projects with multicultural teams in the US, in Europe, in China, in Africa, in Australia. And this so, is 2008, And nine. this is you know, two th between 2005 to 2008, okay. right? Um, and during these days, and I loved it, you know, because I used yeah. to get, travel a lot, uh, <laughs> learn a lot, uh, because the way business is conducted in the US is very different to how it is in Switzerland, to how it is in China, and yeah. how it is happening in India. And again, consulting gives you that opportunity to pick up various projects, projects right? Yeah. So one day I'm doing pharmaceuticals, the other day I'm doing automotive, the third day I'm doing, you know, smart metering in, in US or, or, you know, in, in Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, I love that exposure. Uh, it kind of you know, gave me a lot more confidence to deal with the uh, different complexities of the business world, dealing with people, how to adapt to local cultures, how to appreciate these things. And you know, once you start appreciating these things, you then tend to understand why a person is behaving in a certain way. Right. So it was one of the best coaching um, you know, uh, stints that I could get uh, on live projects. And this is when you know, uh, you know, the, the next stage of my career kind of started shaping up in itself. Um, I was in the US. I was working on a smart metering project. Uh, there was a company in Atlanta. I, you know, typically when you consultants go and have a project, they were seated in a certain area and then yeah. you do your meetings, etc. I was seated right in front of the mail room, right? And every 10 minutes, I would see an Amazon box go in or go out, right? Wow. Somebody would come and collect it. Um, there were a few other websites uh, at that point of time. For example, there was something called uh, Best Buy, Radio Shack, um, and a few Circuit City, which were like electronics retailers at that point of time in the US. And because this was a smart metering company, a lot of people were interested in gadgets. So somebody was buying or something or the other. Right. And I would see every 10 minutes a box. Somebody would come and pick up an Amazon box, a new egg box, or something like that. And I got fascinated. I said, wow, this is great, right? Uh, E-commerce was the way of life in terms of organized retail in the US at that point of time. Mm. And I was also getting a little bit tired. I just got married personally, and I could not do the globe trotting anymore. And while I was back in India, I got in touch with the same friends that had started the portal you know, mm. back in college. And one of them was now deep into e-commerce in India. His name is Hitesh. He, was, um, he had started a few companies. And he said, you know, I'm thinking of starting an e-commerce retail venture, which would sell electronics. E-commerce is you know, something to look forward to in India. Uh, why don't you come you know, as a co-founder and we both can build this together? 
And by this time, Flipkart was in India. And this time, if I look at the e-commerce landscape, uh, Flipkart was selling books. Okay. You know, primarily books. They had not ventured yet into other uh, categories. categories. Amazon was not in India, even mm -hmm. through Jungly or whatever. That was the way they entered India through shopping yeah. comparison to start with. Uh, Snapdeal was into coupons, a okay. very different business. Mintra was a very different business at that point of time. Corporate gifting. There was no shop clues. There was um, no other e-commerce company. eBay. Uh, the eBay India. And yeah. then there were, you know, the e-commerce portals for Redf and India Times that Got were pretty it. prominent at that point of time. So clearly, and I think this is where the opportunity was. Mm -hmm. um, because when people were transacting on certain marketplaces, the user experience was not something that, you know, what people have today. Mm -hmm. um, so there were delays, uh, people would not get what they had uh, seen. Um, and the fact that there was no one focused on ensuring focus on all elements of an e-commerce chain, we saw this as an opportunity. Right. But and it was clear, broadly macro-wise, that e-commerce, India, everything will map, right? Like everything will eventually move towards I think when you're young, you also follow your gut. And yeah. I followed my gut a lot in my life. Yeah. The way I saw it was, internet was something that fascinated me. Okay. It was creating a massive revolution globally. I had seen it firsthand in terms of the impact it was having on retail, mm -hmm. uh, how consumers were embracing it. And when you look at India, I think we all believed in the India story so much at that point of time as well also, and it's only gotten better over the years, that rising middle class, growing internet penetration, a demographic dividend with more younger people would only um, lead to more opportunities in this space, and technology will play a key enabler, yeah. right? Um, and I'm the, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but I'm curious to understand, like, was it evident during that time? Because it feels like now there are enough proof points, enough successes, it's become like commonplace when it comes to startups, right? But like in 20, 2009, Nine as well. Was it like on ground, very clear ki ye to ho gai, or was there like an element of risk that you know consumers may not go for this as well? It might be difficult to scale. Electronics may, logistics might be an issue. What were the like, so you know, the way we looked at it, you know, at that point of time, very interesting question. You know, you're literally taking me a decade ago <laughs> back. Uh, at that point of time, we were very clear that we were very bullish in India. Okay. That. The rising is. middle class, penetration, digital penetration, and the fact that India is a young country, it is very likely that these factors will come together. And you looked at China multiple years ago, um, you know, they were all in this same spot. Um, so as consultants, you can do research yeah. a lot, right? And so I think that kind of gave you the confidence. But to be honest, um, what was also very clear is the problem statement. Mm -hmm. As consumers in India, we were facing those issues. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, I had purchased something on a certain marketplace, I would not name it today, right? Um, and about 20 days later when I received it, it was completely different to what they showed mm. me. So people were not getting you know, the benefits of e-commerce. That's number right. one. The other thing is, if you look at India, we've always leapfrogged, right? Yeah. We went straight uh, from landlines to mobile telephones. Pagers yeah. were there for a very <laughs> small bit. So true. Uh, if you look at it, a lot of people um, started using the internet on a mobile device and they leapfrogged the desktop totally. Yeah. Today, many internet users for the first time come through the, the mobile, mobile device, yeah. right? Um, if, we would see a similar trend in organized retail at that point of time as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you look at the US, retail went from uh, the basic shops to then large format retail in terms of the Macy's, the Sears, etc., big malls, and then online commerce came in to kind of mm -hmm. supplement it. In India, although we did see malls and others come up in some of the urban cities, yeah. a lot of people tasted organized retail for the first time through e-commerce. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine um, just traveling 150 kilometers outside of Delhi. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to buy a blender at that point of time, I'm talking right. 2009. You know, the only place they could go and buy that kitchen blender was maybe one or two stores in their city. Now, when they go to that store, the guy would have only one or two brands at the price that right. he wants to keep at it. So selection was something that people could not get access to. Right. 150 kilometers outside of Delhi at that point of time. Yeah. Right. Second, they were not getting the best prizes. Third, you know, obviously access was a concern, as, as I talked about. So convenience was also at play. They'll have to go and buy this. I mm. still remember 2009, if you had to buy a pen drive, we would have to go to Nehru place and buy maybe something like a gadget <laughs> for your computer, maybe a RAM yeah. or a motherboard or something like that, right? Very um, hard to imagine today. <laughs> very hard to imagine today. But that was the problem. So what did e-commerce, could, what could e-commerce solve then was something that we were very, very strongly focused on. It mm. would solve for convenience. It would solve for access. It would solve for pricing. Mm -hmm. And selection, obviously, correct, because of correct. pricing, right? And we thought, you know, this story has to come true. Correct. And so when you are so, you know, focused strongly on the opportunity at hand, because the macro is kind of in place, 
the problem statement is very clear. Users are facing this. We ourselves are facing this. The challenge and the I would say excitement was to solve it. Yeah. Right. And this is when we looked at you know, Flipkart was doing books. We thought. The second best category, and we looked at various numbers across the world, was electronics. Mm -hmm. Standard product, you know, um, you know a Nokia phone is a Nokia phone, for example, right, right at that point of time. Yeah. So when you order it online, you are, you are most likely to be a little more satisfied if you have trust in the platform. Yeah. And so the focus was how do you build in the platform, how do you create the best customer experience. Yeah. And so we kind of started building relationships, and you're right, the ecosystem was just not there. Yeah. You know, uh, cash on delivery, I think, over the years kind of opened yeah. up e-commerce over a period of time, and that innovation was required. Uh, but uh, even things like logistics, yeah. You know, at that point of time, yes, there were a few large players who would manage logistics, but maybe restricted to a few hundred pin codes uh, for yeah. cities or hundred cities of pin codes, right? Um, but we wanted to solve it at a very larger level. So many of the processes that we put in place at that point of time mm -hmm. became industry practices later. Right. So I think you know that is where I believe more from a personal perspective. I thought creating something from scratch um, kind of gave me a lot more happiness than just kind of taking something from someone and building onto it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that I've kind of figured out as I've grown over the years in terms of my career. So creating something from scratch, focus primarily on India because there's a big opportunity, so many problems to solve. Um, and I think the third thing I would say here is one that has long lasting impact. Right. So even today when I kind of look at opportunities um, to kind of put my time in, whether it's you know helping a founder or something, these three things kind of are very top of mind for me in terms yeah. of does this have a long lasting impact? Will right. it kind of create opportunities at a larger level? Um, does this kind of solve a unique India problem? Um, and obviously you know what the size is and stuff like that. Right. So going back again, at that point of time, we started a company called LetSpy.com. Right. Um, Hitesh started it much before I joined him because I was still okay. finishing my formalities at EY mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, and what started as a five, six people startup, um, eventually rose to almost 400 people within the next 12 to 13 months. So, wow. you know, we raised uh, venture capital money from Axel, Helion, uh, and a few others. Um, and, you know, we became the experts in terms of selling anything that would focus on uh, running with electricity or, you know, batteries. So the three C's was our focus, communications, the mobile devices, etc., computers, um, mm -hmm. and periphery, so everything to do with computers, laptops, mm -hmm. desktops, uh, mouse, keyboard, etc. And then the third was, um, you know, consumer goods. Uh, we, want, we were, in fact, at that point of time, one of the largest uh, retailers for a lot of kitchen appliances and others. And we mm -hmm. built a lot of unique uh, ecosystem in terms of working directly with the brands, creating right. marketplace and kind of, kind of selling it. So it was, it was a lot of fun kind of building from yeah. scratch two things. Yeah. One, shaping consumer habits. Yeah. A lot of people at that point of time were okay to buy a small ticket item, right. were okay to kind of test with a pen drive, right? Um, but convincing them to buy a tablet online. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was the challenge. Which, right? is, which was the Flipkart thesis as well, right? They were of the opinion that, okay, books have low, like, high trust, it's very easy to ship. That's how you Amazon to... also started exactly, if you look yeah. at it from the US, right? Yeah. But how do you get people comfortable shopping online and then mm -hmm. let them shop multiple things online? Yeah. Um, and so electronics was... A, a standard category, but also high ticket purchase, right? So somebody, right. Um, and we worked with the likes of Samsung and Blackberries at that point of time. Um, I still remember Samsung launched their first tablet online on our platform, right? Oh, yeah. They wanted to gauge what the public interest would be like, and they were like really impressed with in terms of the input that we got from people, right? right. Um, and um, I think over the years, uh, we, we were for focus on these three categories to kind of build this out. As time would tell, we, as, a, as we grew from four, to almost 400 people, we added a few more categories, we went deeper into some categories, um, and then eventually Flipkart expressed interest in buying and then we kind of sold out. So at the age of 32, um, you know, I think now in hindsight, maybe we sold too soon, yeah. um, but there were a, 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 multiple other factors at that point of time at play. Right. But that three year journey in terms of, you know, three to four year journey in terms of creating a category from scratch, helping change consumer habits, and then creating an ecosystem that kind of facilitated it, right? Yeah. Whether it was logistics, whether it was reverse logistics, you know, getting yeah. something back was, right? Yeah. It was easy to get somebody to deliver something, but what happens <laughs> yeah. in a return? True, true, um, true. And then what to do with that kind of inventory? Yeah. Um, and then more importantly, creating a pool of people who would hustle and specialize in these fields because those people today are now you know, senior officials in 
in all the e-commerce companies that you can think of. So these people were to shape up the ecosystem as it kind of grew. Right. So when I look back, I think you know we kind of started it. We were lucky to be part of that journey, uh, but it kind of um, I would say one of the best days of my life was kind of you know running running your own company. Awesome, awesome. That's super commendable because you set up something with no infrastructure in place, no talent in place, very little maybe foresight or you know certainty of foresight as to how the consumer play would uh, eventually turn sure. out to be. Uh, and so that's commendable. Like we had the Carrot Lane founder as well, mm -hmm. and that was another similar category, similar right? Category. Like I mean, yeah. you had to set up everything from yeah, scratch, exactly. and that was more like higher AOV as well. So yeah. that was another beast in itself. Let me double click very quickly on mm. that acquisition piece, right? Without making it sound very dramatic, but we all have these, you know, life-changing moments. So you mm. could say that the Hitesh call to you may be life-changing for you, right? Mm. Uh, this acquisition in itself, Flipkart, mm. on the other hand, you know, largest startup in the country, perhaps largest exit in the uh, country as well. You know, the poster boy when it comes to yes. what startups can achieve in the country. Uh, what was the thought then? And, you know, in hindsight, of course, this is not about regrets, but if you had all the data points that you have now, mm -hmm. what would be your thesis? So I think in hindsight, we can all analyze this from multiple <laughs> dimensions, right? Yeah. But uh, I would say no regrets at all. Okay. Uh, we built a great company at that point of time. Mm -hmm. um, we were competing with Flipkart for a very long period in that journey yeah. because they started selling electronics also. Correct, we correct. started selling electronics. And I think that competition kind of brought a lot more innovation, a lot more creativity at both ends. Right. And I think there was a lot of mutual respect for in terms of what each of us had achieved at that point of time. And then eventually Flipkart becoming what it became, you know, there's a lot of respect for what they've done for the ecosystem in India. Um, it's, and, and you know, if your, your company is your baby. Yeah. And you, it's very difficult to part with it, right? Especially when you have very long-term goals in terms of, we had just started, we sold yeah. at a very early stage of e-commerce uh, evolution in India, right? Yeah. Um, the way I look at it is, the biggest lesson there was, A, you do everything with passion, you built it up with passion, the teams were very passionate and we rallied each other to kind of, you know, become the biggest e-commerce retailers when it came to ele electronics. And we were there at the yeah. top when it came to many categories. Mm -hmm. But I think the other element is you also have to take a very, very uh, objective view in terms of what the market reality is. You know, I'm talking about a time when um, there were questions raised about the e-commerce model, okay. about profitability, the fact that Amazon was coming into India, um, you know, the fact that this would be an extremely capital intensive business to kind of run in the long run. Exactly. Um, when you look at all those realities, when you look at, um, you know, the fact that uh, you would need to kind of build this in a very different way over the years. Um, you take a decision at that point of time. Right. And the way we looked at that decision at that point of time was, we built something that we're very proud of. Mm -hmm. um, we would be acquired by India's largest e-commerce company at that point of time. Yeah. Um, and uh, they had their strengths. Uh, it would be a good play for our existing investors to kind of be getting you know, uh, access to that um, mm -hmm. opportunity. Our employees would have a much larger canvas to play on, mm -hmm. you know. And as first-time founders, we thought we were very proud of the fact that we had created a category from scratch. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, there was interest from such a large player to kind of acquire us. Right. And obviously, we had an opportunity to build with them over a period mm -hmm. of time. Uh, so at that point of time, you, as a business person, you keep your emotions aside. Right. And I think and that's that a very, for the very business. what is best for the business, what's best for all stakeholders of the business. Correct. And employees are your very important stakeholders. You know, um, overall growth of the ecosystem is also very important. And I think obviously multiple consultations later, we kind of decided, okay, this is great for everyone. Um, yeah. So no regrets at all. Of course. Um, I think even today, I get a call from so many people who used to work at that point of time with us. Now they are running multiple functions for multiple um, locations or big companies and they say, you know, great learnings. They still remember those times and I think you Lovely. tend to kind of take that in your stride. So it's like... Yeah, yeah. That Im scenario. impact is just unmatched, I think. Yeah. Unmatched, so, even today. Yeah, and to do it that early, right? Yeah. I think that's the beauty of it. A very quickly double clicking on not the transaction per se, but like was Flipkart significantly bigger? Like was it like 5x, 10x? And what was that, you know, like quick conversation, right? Like very quickly, if you had to summarize, okay, this was the interest. What did you think? And then it happened. Like what was that like? So, you scenes? know, I would not get into details, financials okay. and numbers. Obviously, Flipkart was uh, a bigger company at that point okay. of time. They were into multiple more categories. Okay. Um, and they had plans to get into, you know, more. And um, better and capitalized. Uh, better capitalized. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, 
the way we looked at that point of time was the opportunity and the conversation was very simple. Would you want to kind of build this together? You created a great category. You know, mm -hmm. we have other complementary skill sets that can take this from zero to hundred. Yeah. Um, so why not kind of build this together, right? Yeah. And when we looked at the overall ecosystem and multiple other considerations, we thought that was a great position to kind of go. Yeah. And that's what we did. Got it, got it, fair. Um, okay, so now the you know exit has happened. Yeah. You've decided that this is gonna happen. You have multiple pathways. I'm guessing one is potentially join Flipkart, build it out with them. One is take your time, let's say build another company, right? Yeah. And the third, which you ended up taking, I'm sure there are more, but to put things into context, you join Airbnb, right? Mm. Another like non obvious company in the scheme, larger scheme of things, there was a time when everybody refused to believe in the model in itself, right? And Airbnb, at least, you know, my fascination for it tells me that it's probably the most disruptive company of our maybe generation as well, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe the last decade for sure, because yeah. they've created, they, they've just disrupted a business model, they've created employment, they've uh, created value from scratch in terms of mm. tangible wealth as well. Mm. Uh, talk to us about what was playing in your mind, yeah. right? As somebody who evidently comes across as curious, well-reasoned, well, good exposure, early success, right? Mm. Everything was in your favor. Yeah. Uh, you could say that you had all the odds in your favor and you could choose anything. Yeah. Why did you choose Airbnb? How yeah. did that come about and why not the other options? Again, very interesting. Um, so I so the Flipkart transaction happened in 2013. I mm -hmm. took some time off. You know, um, it was a very important time personally for me. Um, my daughter, you know, just uh, we, we were blessed with the daughter at the time, and I wanted to be around her. Um, and I was also taking time to kind of figure out what next, yeah. right? As you rightly said, and there right. were multiple pathways. Right. So um, Flipkart was not an option, though. You didn't consider that. Uh, Flipkart was an option, but okay. we were also, you know, we, I was we were in that building mode at that point of time, right? Hmm. So Fair. Um, it was very clear that now that it is something that is combined and they have a path, um, we wanted to kind of pursue something else so far. So, it. so it was something um, that we consciously took a call on. Um, the idea to kind of start up, Hitesh went on to start up a couple of more companies. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we went to the drawing board together. We are still good friends from college, right? Of course. Um, and, um, you know, he now runs a very uh, strong D2C brand called The Man Company. Yeah. Um, and uh, prior to that, he was, uh, you know, he also started a company called Truly Madly, which is also a, a pretty yeah. predominant dating site. Uh, so he took that path and, you know, uh, it was great. For me, I wanted to kind of kind of take a step back and say, what do I want to learn more, mm -hmm. right? Because the way I looked at it is was, one thing was very clear, mm -hmm. the macro factors from an internet economy were right there. Right. My interest to play a big role in it was still there, mm -hmm. right? Um, and when I kind of thought about these two things, one thing that came to my mind was like that, if I have to be part of the internet ecosystem in India, it'll be great to see what's happening in Silicon Valley, mm. you know, globally. What are some of the companies that are doing well there? What are some of the newer opportunities there, right? And at that point of time, there were two companies that everybody was talking about. Uber, One was Airbnb. Airbnb, the other was Uber, right? Nice. Um, and Uber had just come into India at that point of time. Um, and it was very clear that if you look at the sharing economy, uh, while people considered both Airbnb and Uber part of the sharing economy, in India it was more... Uh, Uber was more of an aggregation of commercial taxi operators Correct. and bringing that service online. And for multiple reasons, you know, um, regulatory or what are the guidelines or uh, the, the kind of ecosystem that prevailed there, that, that was their entry point. Yeah. Uh, one thought came to my mind was the fact that um, if you look at India, mm -hmm. right, hospitality comes intrinsic to our culture. Yeah. I'm sure if you go back in time, there will be many instances where you or your family would have opened up your house to welcome a relative, a friend, uh, a friend of a relative, a relative of a friend, or any permutation or combination. Yes. You would have welcomed them in your house. Yeah. Um, whether you had spare room or not, you would figure out a way to kind of, <laughs> you know, yes. make host them. a very comfortable stay right. for them and host them in the most right. optimal right. manner. The other thing, if you look at, which is very intrinsic to Indian culture, is entrepreneurship. You know, you have an entrepreneur at every nook and corner, whether so it's a true. small shop, whether it's a small service operations or a large business operation or the startups today, right? Um, entrepreneurship comes naturally to Indian, uh, Indians as well, right? Um, the, if you bring an enabler in, mid, in the middle, which is technology, you will be able to bring these two passions to life in a market which is only going to grow. Yeah. And I thought Airbnb was so well poised to do this, right? It's about hospitality. Yeah. It's about people sharing their unique homes, unique experiences, and bringing people into their communities. India is very community-oriented. Um, 
it's also about micro entrepreneurial opportunities because you are able to create a you know you can use utilize an underutilized asset and create monetary gains from it yeah. whether it's your primary home whether it's your secondary home yeah. um, or you do it as a business and run multiple homes which is also something that is now growing right. um, it is a micro entrepreneurial opportunity that benefits you but it also benefits your ecosystem around you and i'll come to that a little later when i explain how airbnb is kind of functioning right yeah. um, when people come and stay in neighborhoods um, they don't only stay with the host they also go dine at a local restaurant they buy from the local grocer they buy from the local shop and yeah. so the entire micro economy kind of benefits right? right and so if you look at it airbnb could be the best possible way to bring entrepreneurship as well as hospitality and enable it with a technological platform which indians also loved yeah quick question how difficult was the you know indian consumers don't essentially welcome strangers per se so that must have been like an obstruction right like think of the 2008 problem statement that airbnb faced until it become obvious right that we can welcome a strangers in your home yeah. that was was that a concern how did you you know uh, to think be honest, about it's that it's not a very india specific concern okay you know that's human behavior that's human behavior okay. at the end of the day uh, so you know i was talking about this to the founders after i went through the process so yeah. you know uh, just zooming out once again i'll address this sure. question so you know i saw what was happening globally and i thought i want to do this yeah. um, one thing led to another i got introduced to you know the airbnb leadership team that was visiting uh, in india at that point of time um i like they liked what i had done um they were looking for someone who had an entrepreneurial approach because this was also category creation this yeah, was about changing absolutely. consumer habits and this was also about creating an ecosystem that would facilitate that yeah, yeah. i'm you sorry know? i'm interrupting yeah. but this was self initiated or did they approach you um it was a common connect okay which kind of brought us together okay um so i spoke with the regional director of apac at that point of time who was visiting okay. india and we went out for dinner um and we discuss everything about india e-commerce my journey etc and this came up and then he said you know this is great why we are looking for someone to lead india mm. would you be interested and, and were they in india then or like so airbnb had an india presence then and okay. to you know it was surprising for many because not many knew that they had an india presence yeah. um and uh, most of the business at that point of time for an airbnb perspective was primarily focused on community management right uh, because see airbnb was a global concept yeah. when people traveled <coughs> word of mouth was something that created the most virality for us so when somebody traveled with with their friends to the us they saw this phenomena yeah. they said i can do this in india so organically the community had grown in india right. to a few hundred and thousand we. right um, and and that kind of was there and and there were teams in india to kind of manage that uh, but uh, you know obviously the company wanted to focus deeply in terms of a strategic road map hiring for various functions on all of that and that is where they were looking out at that point of time i decided to put my hat in and um, one uh, i went through a very detailed process interviews in um you know some team members in india interviews with the regional leadership in singapore and then eventually in san francisco with the global leadership and the founders right yeah. um and it was a great experience right yeah. um and you know going back to what i said earlier i wanted to get a sense of how silicon valley worked hmm. and when i stepped into the airbnb office in san francisco there it was the massive pull right the culture yeah. the energy the vibe the fact that there were people from all walks of life who believed in this mission to create a world where anyone could belong and i think belonging and connection is at the core of what airbnb does from a purpose perspective uh, was so fresh um, you know such a fresh i would say um, over uh, from an attitude perspective that i said okay i want to be part of this right and i said um, you know obviously they liked me they liked my story they liked my plans for india and and i was given the role to kind of build the airbnb presence in india in 2015 so this is january 2015 okay 15 right um so it's been almost 9 years that i've been with them now um and um, again going back to the focus around hospitality india impact those three things kind of you know led me to kind of build this and uh, over the years obviously initially i built the team uh, hired cross functional leaders across comms marketing policy yeah. uh, multiple other functions that are required had to create a unique playbook for india as well because yeah. the playbook that had worked for airbnb for the, in the us or in europe would not work for us here, right, right? Um, and so what would be those local nuances i kind of put in but going back to the question in terms of you know we had opened up our homes but we would would we open it up for strangers was the yeah. key question but I remember having this conversation with one of the founders at Airbnb at that point of time Nate and he said this was the same question we faced in the US yeah. the same question we faced in Europe 
the same question we faced in Australia, right? right. So it's not unique to India. Yeah. What we need is a solution which would be unique to India to build trust, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so trust is at the core of what we do. And over the years, our product, the way it is built, whether it is, you know, ID background checks, verification, yeah. uh, whether it is the review system. So when you stay on Airbnb and you complete a stay, the guest reviews the host, the host reviews the guest, yeah. and over a period of time, you build a reputation yes. online, yeah. right? Um, and both people, bo both the sides, the host and the guest, work very hard to maintain that reputation. Mm. Um, and so uh, the third piece was, you know, payments. The fact that Airbnb yeah. controlled all payments on uh, on the system, and the host would be paid out paid out only once. The promise of the hospitality or the delivery that he had promised is is met. It is only yeah. when he would pay. So all these things over a period of time, plus obviously, you know advanced machine learning technologies to kind of figure out problems or red flags uh, based on multiple indicators. We've kind of evolved over a period of time. Um, so inherently, what we understood through this journey is people are good, yeah. right? They want to connect. They want to know each other. Yeah. And they want to bring people into their communities and showcase their uniqueness or what they are famous for. Right. And I think Airbnb is a great platform where this happens on a daily basis, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of people open up their homes uh, and bring people in. A lot of people, our host community in India, they do not do this for the money, mm -hmm. right? There are a lot of empty nesters, for example. Their yeah. children have not, don't stay with them. They are in other countries studying or working there. And they have these large spaces. Um, and they want to connect with more people to kind yeah. of you know meet with them, share their stories, learn from them. And so it's not about the nightly rate that they will earn from Airbnb. It's about the connection. Right. right? And there are so many strong stories. I talk to hosts on a daily basis in India and Southeast Asia. And I think this is a common thread. Yeah. The, the magic is always in the people. The magic is always in the connection. Mm -hmm. And how you make people feel when they come and stay with you is where the real magic lies. And I think that is the unique fabric for Airbnb, I would say. I love that. I think that so perfectly summarizes, you know, all the things that Airbnb does so well. It gives us an insight into your mind as well as to how the journey has progressed because it's so interesting, right? You had the benefit of, I'd say, you know, just out because of your passion, curiosity, right place, right time, as they say, yeah. and how you leverage that to your advantage with some incredible foresight is just mind blowing. Uh, I some you know, lucky. distinct. Lucky. No, no. I think you're kind to say that you have to you know make yourself lucky, as so many people say. Yeah. Um, and it's just amazing because you know outside in at least you could say that you had you know as I said before you could do anything and everything, right? You could yeah. start a company, you could join Flipkart, you could uh, join, you could move to the valley, right? Yeah. You could do anything, yeah. but yeah. you decided yeah. this. How many people can say that you know you could identify Airbnb, really join them? In hindsight, there. it kind of looks like <laughs> that, but I think I was just following my gut yeah. at that point of time, right? Believe in the macro fundamentals. Yeah. Follow your heart in terms of where you see you can add value. Yeah. Right. And um, have the and I think the biggest thing for me during that period is, is this work company working for a larger purpose? Right. Because and I think over the years I've kind of understood the importance of the impact purpose-led companies have had. Right. Yeah. Uh, the fact that you're not working towards getting more room nights. Or you're not working towards getting more listings on the platform, Correct. but there is a larger play of of kind of you know facilitating belonging, on making sure that you create a world where anyone can belong anywhere. Yeah. And then you have teams rallying behind all of this cause on a daily basis to bring this to life. Yeah. You know, I think that kind of for me was the biggest learning. And for me, I've seen this now when I zoom out and say the brands that I really like or the products that I really consume. There is this purpose angle to it. And, and what I've seen so far, Jivraj, and maybe you can share better because you belong to that set, is millennials and Gen Z today, you know, value experiences more than products, number Absolutely. one. They also want to make very well-informed choices in terms of what products they choose or what services they consume or yeah. from where they consume. Yeah. And for them, purpose matters a lot, right? Yeah. Um, they want to be associated with a sustainable brand, for example. They want to be associated with, um, you know, a product that kind of, um, is made through a certain kind of innovation, for example. Yeah. And I think that purpose, what the brand stands for, what they're trying to do is now supreme. And I saw that many, many yeah. years ago with Airbnb. And I kind of, kind of, you know, fell in love with that, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and today, when I look at even the choices people are making to stay on Airbnb, yeah. right? That's my core business on a daily basis, right? We see that travel is increasingly led by millennials and Gen Z now in India or in other parts of the world. Right. And they value unique, authentic experiences more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think Airbnb is such a powerful platform because it brings to the forefront, you know, opportunities for micro entrepreneurs to bring, you know, these services onto the platform and bring people into their communities. And I think that's the secret sauce. 
Absolutely. I think that's so important to echo because, you know, the brand just speaks to you, I think. Just the little things that they've done, you know, the story that they've been able to entrench. Like, I probably, you know, heard all of Brian Chesky's stories, right? Like, you know, the credit card maxing out, yeah. they arranged a breakfast, breakfast before they actually got, yes. like, funding and they named it very interestingly. Nobody believed in them, but there was this one guy and then it became, like, an a entire phenomena. Uh, it's just incredible. Uh, why don't we combine some of, you know, your learnings to the Airbnb model and understand that bit, yeah. just to understand how to run a, a global brand brand in the country, right? Um, and your advantage of, so you've seen this breadth, right, with con consulting. You've now seen the zero to one journey with let's buy. You've now moved on to this one to 10, 10 to 100, call it whatever, yeah. really significant challenge entering a new market with a product that is, you know, already has its DNA. They already know what they are doing, but they yeah. really want to crack a new market. And then you also crack Southeast Asia for that matter, right? Uh, talk to us about what are some of the, you know, uh, maybe where we can start is, are there any significant insights that you had in 2015 that you were radically wrong about uh, and, you know, you got proven wrong about continuously? Like, this was, you know, what you thought, okay, ye hoga. But, ek dam opposite ho gaya. Mm -hmm. Anything that comes to mind? Oh, that's an interesting angle to it. So, I think, the way I look at it is, yes, we've been proven wrong multiple times, right? Mm -hmm. And we've been pleasantly surprised by it. I would say, one piece would have been the pace of digital adoption. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, there was a certain graph that everyone was projecting in terms of how many people would get onto the internet, how many would consume with the internet, how many would shop on the internet. Right. And I know there are, these numbers are debatable, some agency says something or the other, <laughs> but the real fact is, it has been pretty rapid. Hmm. Right? And yes, COVID and the time during COVID, it was unfortunate, but it kind of accelerated digital adoption, whether mm -hmm. it was payments, whether it was retail, whether it was, you know, right. now what we see is adoption in multiple other services as well. Uh, so I think one thing that has surprised me is the pace at which the digital adoption has happened and how companies that have not been able to kind of deal with the same are now struggling, right? Mm. Uh, and when I say deal with the same, it's not just the consumer offering. Yeah. It's also the changing nature or the nuance of how people want to work with those companies, for example. Right. So one is digital adoption, the other is, you know, we, we often say that the workforce that was there pre-pandemic and the workforce that is there post-pandemic are very different. Yeah. In terms of their needs, in terms of their outlook, in terms of where they want to focus on. Right. And companies that have not been able to match up to that are now kind of struggling, right? So flexibility, for example, is one of the most debatable pieces right now, right? Uh, whether it's work from home, whether it's hybrid, etc. Right. But I think the larger nuance is the workforce now has a certain expectation from the companies. It is from the brand in terms of what they stand for. And more importantly, like what the flexibility they get to bring their most authentic self onto the platform. Companies are struggling with that, right? And so, so I think for me, all of this has evolved over a period of time. Yeah. Um, the pace of digital adoption, how hybrid working has now become a norm yeah. for many businesses. And what does this mean for, you know, the lines that have now blurred between living, traveling and working? How do you kind of cater to that, right? Yeah. And so I would say that it's been a great experience to be, you know, in the front row seat of this change, seeing this change to happen, yeah. where people have adopted technologies, adopted new forms of commerce, uh, but also seen how problems have evolved related to that and how amazing entrepreneurs and amazing startup talent has come in to kind of bridge that gap as well, right? Yeah. Um, so kind of goes back that it's a unique India story or nuance that where there is opportunity, you'll find someone building a solution for it, right? And, right. and I think we've seen that play out in India as well. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's talk about that last bit uh, directly for a minute, right? You've been talking about this difference in India vis-a-vis -vis difference in the US, playbook. right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of just like consumer behavior, in terms mm. of building up yeah. the playbook. Yeah. Yeah. What was that uh, in terms of, you know, if you had to quantify some distinct learnings that Airbnb, you know, for for Airbnb it worked in India vis-a-vis, -vis, it didn't work in the US or sure. anything so, of the kind? I would not say whether it worked anywhere else or not, Correct. but I would what, say what, what was India, very unique for India, yes. right? So if you look at it, you know, again, zooming out, Airbnb is a global brand. Mm -hmm. Many people do not know about this in India at that yeah. point of time. Um, so one key challenge was how do you increase awareness? Brand building. So brand yeah. building. Okay. You could either follow a very, very traditional path of, you know, brand marketing, yeah, yeah. you know, ad The films, basics. Or you could find ways to tap into the cultural zeitgeist of India. And mm -hmm. when you look at that, what, or in a simpler way to say, what is the popular conversation in terms of cultural conversation that is happening in India? 
Now, if you look at it, can you tell us more about this? Like, yeah, what was that? Sure. And how did you? So, like, if you look at it, what drives cultural conversation in India? So, if our target audience is the millennials and Gen Z per se, because they are the ones who are exploring the world, they are the free, independent travelers. Um, if you look at it, what kind of influences them? Mm -hmm. So, in India, again, the whole piece around Bollywood cricket works, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, because there is massive fan following in terms of understanding what your favorite cricketer is doing or what your favorite star is doing. And people are very interested in their lifestyles, right? And travel is a lifestyle. And travel is a very visual lifestyle mechanism, yeah. right? Um, and with social media, uh, a lot of people now follow uh, these people to kind of get inspiration in terms of where to travel next. Correct. We thought it's a great opportunity because many of these stars were also using Airbnb organically. Right. And what we had to do is just let them tell their story. Mm. You know, so over the years we have kind of created um, these wonderful opportunities for people to, for example, go and stay in Yuvraj Singh home in Goa. Yeah. Right. Yuvraj becoming a host. Yeah. People kind of going inside the house and seeing his pictures from his childhood in terms of how he trained, yeah. getting access to his bat, which was, you know, from his school days, etc. That yeah. was very unique. So yeah. Airbnb kind of facilitate that unique access, yeah. which people really love to be part of in a very different way. So it's not Yuvraj Singh endorsing Airbnb on an okay. ad or saying, you know, do this or buy that. But people tr giving, be given an opportunity to experience Truly one day experience. in the life of Yuvraj in yeah. the most authentic way. You know, we were able to get Shah Rukh Khan's and Gauri Khan's Delhi home onto the platform. Again, which kind of gave a glimpse of their early life in Delhi, for example, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then we were able to, so other thing that kind of is very, very close to Indians is the rich legacy and history that we have, right? Yeah. Um, so the palaces in India, in yeah. Rajasthan. So we got the city palace of Jaipur, where they became the first royal hosts on the platform, yeah. right? All of this created massive virality and buzz for people to get interested in, okay, what is Airbnb, yeah. right? How do you get access to such unique things? Uh, by on this platform and yeah. when something is getting an access to such a unique thing can I get access to something unique for my next weekend in Goa yeah right oh a great hundred year old Portuguese villa with a swimming pool and it comes with a with a great cook who buys the produce from the local farmer so it's also sustainable right and the water is recycled there yeah. wow this is something I want to do it right yeah. so kind of tapping into that was very important yeah I have a Airbnb story of doing things that don't scale is one of the most famous startup stories right where folks at Airbnb are very famous to have lived in host houses yes. right yeah. to really adapt to the culture understand what hosts think yeah. were there any such you know instances in your you know understanding of the market yeah. understanding of yeah. how to scale the model can yeah. you throw some you know, so, yeah. so if you look at it obviously you know Airbnb is about now millions of homes on the platform absolutely uh, and India is not a do-it-yourself market, right? Yeah. Um, so there is the service level expectation that people have. Um, yeah. So I still remember, globally, Airbnb would run an ad in terms of, you know, this is a good opportunity, your home could pay for your hobby, etc. People would come onto the platform, find what they need to do, and then go through the process and become a host. Right. Self-serving. In India, that was not the case, mm. right? Um, so initially, to seed the market, we did a very, very India-specific play where we had feet on street folks from Airbnb who would map each neighborhood where we thought, you know, there were good homes um, and people would be willing to kind of open their homes and there was interest for travelers to come into those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And we conducted these small community workshops. Now, obviously, yeah. you cannot scale this over a period of time, right? Absolutely. But it was important to do it at, in the initial years. So at any point of time, we had almost 70 to 80 people in different cities across India, wow. you know, in neighborhoods, in a coffee shop, talking to 10 people and wow. explaining what Airbnb is and what the benefits of the platform are, right? What it led to was it created interest in the host community to kind of list their spaces on the platform. Yeah. And these teams that we would call, you know, um, the, the, the hosting teams on the ground would be in the market for, say, two months, create awareness, get people to engage with another host so that they could learn from that host community. Right create platforms where the host could engage with themselves, learn from each other, and create an ecosystem and then get out. Mm. And let the market grow from there, right? Oh. And obviously, you know, this I'm telling to get, say, for example, to from 50 listings to 200 listings in Agra. This was the approach then. 
Today we have hundreds and thousands of listings in all yeah. Indian cities, right? And this is in 2016. 17. And this is 2016 17. Nice. And this was something which was very unique. We had not done this globally, but it was important to do this in India. Yeah. Right? And we did this. Yeah, this is a great India first example. Great India first example. Yeah. Great things that do not scale. Okay. But <laughs> doing that is important to understand the nuances, right? Yeah. And over a period of time, the host understood what the platform did. And today, we follow maybe a semi global playbook in terms of people come onto the platform, the awareness is high. It's a self-serve. We've created many innovations um, over the last many years in terms of our upgrades to our service, yeah. which has made it very easy to host for people to come onto the platform and start doing it, right? Yeah. But in 2015, we had to literally conduct these community workshops or community meetups, as we call it, uh, wherein people would be introduced to Airbnb through someone they know. They would bring a friend along to kind of understand, and they started hosting. Mm. And the journey for many people to host started there. So very India-specific nuance, right? Yeah. Apart from that, you also have to do a lot of, you know, Indians love to pay via net banking because people don't like the credit culture when yeah. they're doing what they save up for their travel. So yeah. they want to pay through a bank, right? Yeah. And, and so making sure that you enabled all of that was also very critical. Yeah, that's that also very time. India first. Very India first, right? Yeah. Um, you would not even think of the payment instrument becoming critical. Yeah, yeah. But Indians love to save, uh, you know, for their travels. Um, yeah. And then kind of buy and, and kind yeah, of do that. Prepay right? for your travel. Prepay, pre-save for your travel and then pre-save pre-pay, and right? pre-pay, yeah. yeah. So that was very unique. And then obviously the choice of destinations was also very unique for India. Mm-hmm. If you look at it in India, a large opportunity for us is a domestic travel market, right? Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, a lot of focus is also on the international market for us. So Indians traveling abroad, for me, both are very important. Um, and we are seeing growth come up across these two segments in a big way. So I'll tell you, right? India adds almost 10 to 12 million passports every year. Okay. There are already about 100 million people with passports in India. You know, So look at the population now. Very young, mm. middle class is growing, there is discretionary spend, right. they are connected to the internet, mm. uh, they are on social media, so they are getting inspiration from where to go, what to do, what to explore. Yeah. And now they are so globally curious, they want to travel. Yeah. So it creates a massive opportunity for all travel businesses. right? Yeah. Having said that, a, maybe one family or you know a, a couple millennial couple may take one or two overseas trips in a year, mm. but they take five to six domestic trips in a year. It right. could be a weekend getaway, it could be summer holidays, it could be a, a trip with family with friends. One thing that early on we also figure out is that religious destinations do very well, right? So spirituality, mm. in a way, also contributes big in terms of your travel decisions. Right. So some people say, okay, I would go and visit a shrine, mm. and the next two days I'm gonna chill and holiday someplace yeah, close yeah. to, right? So we were able to map these specific travel behaviors, travel nuances, and say people from Delhi are more likely to do this, people from Bombay are more likely to do this, and yeah. then we catered our service to kind of ensure that we have enough listings in those places, our messaging around comms was there, so I think that kind of grew. The other thing I believe, you know, which was very unique to India, and also from a brand building perspective, very unique to Airbnb, is we are a company that relies very heavily on comms, PR, mm-hmm. right? Because travel and Airbnb lends very uh, lends to storytelling very well, right. right? People have amazing experiences when they go stay with various folks. People stay in unique accommodations. People get introduced to newer places through the host. They want to talk about it, yeah. right? And so what we have seen is just giving a voice to those people. So a lot of our host stories uh, is something that we kind of amplify through various mediums. Yeah. A lot of people sharing their unique guest stories, p- yeah. favorite places to stay, you know, wish lists as a feature does very well on Airbnb and, and we continue to evolve that. All of that were very India specific things that kind of yeah. started the flywheel rolling for us in terms of people getting interested in the platform. Yeah. Do I say we are still there? No, still a lot of work to be done. Um, a lot of people today use us only internationally, they want to, there is an opportunity for them to use us domestically. COVID changed that a little bit. Yeah. When borders were sealed, people could not travel overseas. You know, a lot of people started traveling within India and traveling to newer places. In fact, I was looking at a statistic that was very, very exciting for me. Almost a hundred new small towns and cities in India got their first bu- bookings during the COVID period or just after the COVID period. Oh, wow. Right? Because people wanted to get away. People wanted to get away 100 kilometers from your place, mm. right? And they wanted more control over the surroundings. So they did not want to go and stay in a traditional form of hospitality like a hotel. Yeah. But they wanted to stay in a rural house. They wanted yeah. to stay in an ecological, you know, stay in a, in a jungle, for example. Yeah. Or they wanted to stay closer to a national reserve park. Yeah. 
Mm. These communities had not seen the benefits of tourism in the past. Mm. But now with a platform like Airbnb and with changing consumer preferences where people are looking for these authentic experiences, they were getting the first taste of you know tourism dollars coming in their home. And I think mm. that is one of the most fundamental changes I've seen post-COVID, mm. where a lot of people, when they make their travel choices, are now making it in a much more conscious and responsible manner. Mm. Where do I stay? What are the practices being implemented there? Who is the host? What is yeah. the community I would visit? When I visit this community, what is the impact I would have be because of my visit, socially, economically? Yeah. And this is shaping the way people travel, and we are seeing this in our statistics. For example, where people travel, how yeah. long they stay, what do they spend on? Yeah. Well, that's so fascinating. I think the the storytelling part especially, right? It's such a personal experience, right? Yes. Sharing your home with somebody, building a connection, right? Exactly. I still distinctly remember, this is not from India, but we went to Interlaken and we stayed at a 300 uh, old, 300 year uh, old sort of home, right? And yeah. she was like, these two rooms are booked throughout the year and it's an entire experience. And we spoke uh, with the host during dinner and it's such a special feeling, right? Exactly. So it, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Do you have any distinct stories yourself with like hosts, uh, not travel destination, but hosts that, you know, sort of blew your mind and like just special stories when it comes to Airbnb hosts? I think every story is, is so, so unique. unique. Right, and I love talking to hosts. You know, every time I go and stay, or every time I'm interacting from a just understanding perspective, mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest learnings also from a COVID perspective is, you know, when obviously COVID happened, this was something that no one had anticipated. There was no playbook to kind of right. you know deal with this. Um, and as a travel business, 90% of our business just vanished in, in yeah. one day. Uh, globally, not just yeah. in India. 90% yeah. of the planes were grounded, borders were sealed, people were not letting each other into their countries, um, and so it was a very very difficult time for the entire industry and also for our host communities because for many of them the money that they would receive from guests yeah. would pay for their mortgage for pay Correct. for their bills etc right and that all stopped yeah. so we had to go back to the drawing board right and say mm -hmm. okay what do we do now and and i think one of the best lessons in terms of leadership that i was able to have a front row seat on was you know brian kind of coming um through the crisis and kind of creating such a massive focus back on what is core to Airbnb, and that is yeah. our host community, right? And I saw all of that play out in action. Yeah. And I think one of the key um, you know, tools that he used at that point of time was listening to the community. Hmm. So I remember early days when all of these changes were happening, globally, we would have thousands of listening sessions with our hosts. Uh -huh. A, to understand how they're feeling. Yeah. B, what are their expectations of, from us? what can they do and many of them had amazing ideas in terms of what they can do to kind of help weather the situation obviously no one knew what was happening at that point of time right yeah. uh, but the fact that we went back to our host community to understand how to help and what to kind of create led to a few unique projects also within airbnb for example um, our host said that they still wanted to connect Although they could not now welcome people in person, right. they still wanted to connect, they still wanted to share their unique skill sets and experiences with people. Um, on the other hand, we heard from our guests that they were stuck in their homes, but they wanted to use technology to still kind of explore. Mm. And that created what you know was a very successful project for us called Online Experiences. Mm. Wherein within 15 days, as a team, we were able to create an opportunity for our hosts to showcase experiences or their learnings or their you know knowledge or their passions through an online medium mm -hmm. wherein guests sitting in any part of the world could get access to it some of the amazing you know experiences that were online purely were somebody said once covid is over i want to travel to spain mm -hmm. and this guy uh, in spain as a host would share everything about spain that they could talk about unique itineraries, oh, amazing. you know, unique cultures, so that someone sitting here is very well equipped to make a call in terms of where to go, you know, in terms of staying. Apart from this, many online cooking experiences, I attended online, um, you know, concerts wherein somebody was playing a guitar on a boat in the Netherlands, okay. and there were people across the world, I'm sitting in Delhi, somebody sitting in, you know, Bombay, somebody sitting in Tokyo, we all are coming together, listening to that guy play wow. the amazing music and us sharing a drink while, you know, still in our homes. Right. Um, and so there are so many unique stories, right? Uh, but one thing that I have always felt very, um, you know, very strongly about is to create micro entrepreneurial opportunities right mm -hmm. um, and one of the key partnerships we did in india and i love to talk about that is uh, with a group called seva okay okay so seva is a self-help group of about two million rural women in india 
mostly in Gujarat and other places. Um, and um, I got in touch with them um, and they wanted to create more livelihood opportunities for this group. Mm -hmm. um, and they wanted to understand how could Airbnb be one of those. Yeah. And we were like, okay, so these are rural women, mm -hmm. um, not very digitally savvy, um, you know, and they have rural homes. So we created a cohort, um, worked with Seva, created a trainer trainer program wherein we train most of them around best hospitality practices, how to create a unique experience in their home, how to use the app, how to converse in various languages, etc., or how to use enablers within the app to kind of do this in a more seamless way. Um, and about 20 odd women from Seva became Airbnb hosts on the platform. Oh, wow. And the impact and the result which came after they came onto the platform from there to about one year, the amount of money they were able to earn for many families, it surpassed the annual you income. know, income that they would earn from their own things. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Uh, and just, you know, when I, go, when I went and spoke to these hosts, the amount of pride they had that now they were the ones who were leading the economic charge within the family. Yeah. And they said, you know, this has uplifted us socially, economically, and now we have a very strong say in the way the village decides on certain decisions. Because yeah. not only did tourists come and stay into their homes and got a glimpse of their unique culture, and Gujarat is a vibrant culture, um, the local unemployed youth also got an opportunity to learn driving and become a driver for these tourists. Somebody who would only sell their craft through a certain channel now had another channel open up because there are foreigners yeah. coming and staying with you. And one thing led to the another, and an entire ecosystem flourished. Yeah. Right? For me, that is the real impact of a platform like Airbnb, yeah. wherein you are able to create micro entrepreneurial opportunity where it did not exist, yeah. using technology, enabling connection, where somebody, a guest, is now staying in a rural household in Gujarat and understanding how that culture has evolved and why people behave in a certain way. Appreciate that, go very enriched himself or herself, while created micro-entrepreneurial and economic opportunity in those communities. Hmm. And that kind of fueling another micro-economic uh, impact, yeah. wherein newer opportunities, newer hosts, newer homes would yeah. kind of come out of the platform. Amazing, right? And that, we have done this not only with Seva now in Gujarat, we have done this in the Northeast, we have done it in Ladakh, um, we work with multiple other partners around, wow. we work with various state governments, for example, we work with the government of Goa, government of Maharashtra, uh, to enable this in underserved communities. And I think that is a great example. <clears throat> Personally, I've traveled multiple places with my family. You know, I still remember a host uh, was waiting for my entire family and I was traveling with my in-laws at that point of time, um, you know, with fresh orange juice in like blistering heat in, in Santorini yeah. just to welcome us because, you know, they knew we were coming, walking uh, from a long distance and we would be tired. And just that five minutes of welcome, that special. connection with the host, it was so special. And again, you know, I can go on in terms of the various <laughs> unique stays, but, but I think that's for some, some, some point. Yeah. That's so commendable. I think uh, the initiatives you mentioned, right? I mean, uh, beyond the commercial impact of the company, it's just so much in terms of the societal impact and oh, the yes. flywheel yes. it has uh, created. It's just very, very special, very commendable. I'm so glad you mentioned it. Um, very quickly, bringing a close to the you know learnings from yeah. Airbnb model, I think there were, you, you touched upon this briefly, right? The COVID aspect. So from what I understand, right? Airbnb is preparing for an IPO. COVID hits, yeah. right? And then I think, and I mean, this is very personal, so I could be uh, grossly wrong here, but I think some of the best display of leadership from maybe Brian, right? Like there was so much empathy. Uh, there were layoffs for some yes. reason, right? But there was so much empathy, direct communication, uh, an effort to get everyone, you know, placed who was laid yeah. off, an entire portal for that. Yeah. Uh, and then you would probably consider, you know, a companies to be down and out after such an event, right? When 90% of your business is hit, this is no joke. But then you come up and, you know, come up with the IPO again. Uh, and the IPO is not just like uh, an event, right? Yeah. The company has done incredibly well. Yeah. Uh, I think some 100 billion in market cap, again, beyond the metrics, the impact, the free cash flow, it has this step. So what, what I want to understand broadly is these two things, right? How do you navigate COVID in just from a business lens, yeah. right? You yeah. mentioned briefly, yeah. but then how do you turn that around and be a part of an IPO like 
Airbnb, right? We've yeah. not seen this kind of scale. Roller I mean, coaster. Right? I can't, I can't think of a hundred billion dollar company apart yeah. from these like couple TCS Reliance, yeah. all of these, yeah. right, in the country. Mm -hmm. So to be a part of this collective, what was that magical moment, right? Just walk us through I think being the, in that place. The entire journey was was very, very. I won't, you know, magical, yes, now in hindsight when you look at it being part of this, but it was yeah. a roller coaster at that point of yeah. time, right? Um, yes, the business was gone 90%. Yeah. Uh, we had to unfortunately let many of our team members go um, because there was a realignment in terms of focus. Yeah. Uh, there were many areas that Airbnb was working on pre-pandemic in terms of, you know, uh, bringing it to the consumers that people did not know about at that point of time. Mm -hmm. um, we had homes and we had experiences, there were, there were many other areas that we were working on. But when the crisis hit, A, there was no playbook to deal with it. And so I think great uh, you know, example of leadership, as you rightly said, uh, with the founders led by Brian, but also all the you know, leadership across the regions as well as at the global headquarters coming together to say, let's focus on what is core to us, which is our host community, and kind of bringing all our energies towards that one, pos put, you know, one big focus to say, we need to stand by our casual host community, people who host you know, in you know, once in a week or once uh, their primary homes or their primary rooms. That is the core essence of Airbnb and we need to make sure that their interests are protected. Okay. Um, and uh, we looked at, you know, we call ourselves a 21st century company you know, at that point of time. And one of the key tenets was that we want to keep in mind the interests of all key stakeholders, our host community, our guest community, the internal employees, and all communities that get impacted when all these things comes together. And so we looked at everything from that lens. And I think that for me was a great lesson, that you do not act in silo. You look mm -hmm. at it from a global stakeholder perspective and say, we right. need to come good on all these stakeholders, whether it's our employees. So the way we did it, right, in terms yeah. of making sure it was an unfortunate decision. Um, and obviously it was a very difficult decision to let go, um, but then making sure that they have enough opportunities and we do it in the right manner, I think we created the playbook to how to do this in yeah. terms of the most compassionate manner ever. Um, it was about our hosts and guests and we did multiple things. It was about the communities that were getting impacted. For example, during COVID, we came up with a program called the Frontline Stays, uh, wherein homes were open up for frontline workers, you know, yeah. um, and it was very important that we care for them because they were the ones at the front line, whether it's the nurses, the medical practitioners, or security, etc. all of them. Yeah. Uh, so keeping the interests of all these stakeholders in mind, what can we do as a platform was core to us, right? Yeah. So that's one. Uh, the other thing, very you know, top level lessons, going back to our community and listening to them. Hmm. Big, big lesson. I think I talk to so many founders today and I give them always be closer to your customers, you know. Not in the best times, not in the worst time, but always in terms of just yeah. understanding what do they need. They will tell you what no other Excel sheet, no consultant, no other PowerPoint presentation will be able to tell so you, right? True. And we, I saw that in action. Yeah. Thousands of listening sessions across the company to speak to the host to A, tell them we are there, but B, understand what can we do. And yeah. online experiences coming out of that is a great example, right? Um, over the years, Airbnb has also done this where we speak to our community, um, Brian does this very well on Twitter as well in terms of what new features they would like to see yeah. on Airbnb. Uh, and all of those are then taken very seriously in our product roadmaps, etc., right. wherever possible, and then they become features, right? So, for example, in May, we announced about 50 new upgrades to the guest side and the yeah. host side service, right? One of the key areas was go back to the community and based on their feedback, hmm. build these features, right? Yeah. And so, going back to the consumers, going back to your community and listening to them is core. So that was what key learning. Uh, the third is communication. Mm. I think at that point of time, I saw our leadership, including Brian, on calls most of the time, yeah. right? Making sure that they are there to address any anxiety, any questions, um, are there to listen to new ideas, creative input, and over communicate time and again in terms of what the focus is, why we're doing this, how we are doing this and what support they need. So I think for me, that was one of the biggest lessons in terms of how to run a company when crisis hits, right? Communication, going back to the core of the business that kind of makes you unique and listening to your customers. Yeah. Um, and then focusing on a fewer things that have bigger impact. And I think that, yeah. you know, when, when someone asked me what's the difference between a zero to one and then scaling journey, I would say that the fact that the ability to say no to things Mm. It's very important and very important muscle for people to build right. because there will be multiple opportunities on the table. Correct. But when you're scaling, focusing on fewer things that have bigger impact Correct. is the, the secret play right there. Yeah. And I think that's very important. I saw that in action then. Um, 
the pandemic, obviously, you know, while we were navigating this, the other thing that emerged was the fact that now people could work from home. So there was mm. flexibility to work from home. Right. And it was very easy for us to see that that work from home could be any home. Yeah. Right. And which is the best platform to provide access to these many homes across the world? We thought it's Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Right, so we came up with very creative and innovative products that would cater to the apprehensions to stay in these homes. For okay. example, we came up with a, a cleanliness protocol that was very tailored to the homestay industry. Um, we call it ECP. Uh, we had one of the best global experts come together to kind of design this protocol that we then um, disseminated to our hosts that they followed so that it created more confidence for guests to go and travel. Mm -hmm. But this flexibility, which became a norm now, um, you know, I believe created massive opportunity for Airbnb. Yeah. Because the lines between traveling, living and working blurred with this flexibility coming into play. People could take um, you know, their work calls from anywhere, Zoom enabled yeah. that. Um, schools were happening remotely. Yeah. So people were not tethered to one location. And so we started seeing people book Airbnbs in globally as well as in India, yeah. you know, in Goa for three months in the hill stations for two, three months. Yeah. Because they said, if we can work from home, why not work in a place where they can go out, have a stroll at the beach, you know, why tether to an urban city then? Correct. Because you're no longer required to go to the office. Right. And when these lines blurred, it created massive opportunity for Airbnbs to get booked. And I think that kind of helped us get out of the pandemic as well. But not just get out, but long-term stays became one of the key mainstay Focus. features for yeah. Airbnb now. You know, now a large part of our business globally, as well as in India, comes from stays that are more than 30 days that are booked on Airbnb, oh, wow. right? Um, so, you know, hill stations, beach towns, yeah. even rural areas, a lot of people have gone there and now work from there because they have this newfound flexibility. Yeah. So I think beyond COVID, we saw the rise of the conscious traveler, as I said. Yeah. Uh, we also saw um, the rise of, in terms of people wanting off the beaten path destinations. Because planes were grounded, people yeah. were not getting onto planes. So they said, okay, one tank full, 300 kilometers, let's find a place and stay. Because right. we can work from there. All you needed is the internet, yeah. which thankfully with the geos and the ATELs of the world are easily available now. Yeah. Um, you know, we did see a lot of people experience Airbnb for the first time in a very unique way. And right. that is now sticking. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I think those are such crucial learnings for just crisis management, right? Yeah. Because it has a lot of simplicity, yet a lot of focus on just just normal things, right? That you have to continuously reinforce. It has empathy, it has leadership, it has communication, yeah. it has innovation, right? A combination of so much uh, that it just... Uh, I think it's a great learning for so many folks because currently also many would say, right, you know, it's a turbulent time for startups, yeah. especially in India, there's a lot happening across the world, of course, tech stocks, all of that. Uh, but these are great learnings which are omnipresent across business cycles. You know, Airbnb was born in a recession. Yeah. Right. And so uh, a lot of time people talk about turbulent times for startups, you know, maybe a recession is on the way or not on the way. Um, I do believe that going back to the core tenets in terms of yeah. solving a problem, you know, using technology to enable this and then building in the most effective manner in terms of not being reckless, focusing on things that have larger impact okay. um, and innovation and continuously learning from your consumer help you to kind of grow the business. Absolutely. And I think that kind of works in any environment, any business, tech, tech, non-tech, whatever, right? And I yeah. think these fundamentals are something that are very important as kind of people grow new businesses or start new businesses now. Yeah, no, I'm so glad you echoed it because I think the objective of this conversation was also largely to bring out these specific learnings, right? Yeah. Which at scale you witness, which at scale you understand and live through and only then can, you know, essentially yeah. portray. So I think that's going to be really helpful. No, awesome. I think that yeah. really that really helps us bring perspective to you know how the crisis was handled very quickly. What was that IPO moment like, right? To be a part of such a scale IPO. Yeah. What was that like, just qualitatively? I want to understand. You know, I think it was also very unique because it happened on Zoom for everyone. Yeah, yeah. So there was no bell that was rung. At, exactly. At, you know, at the stock exchange, it was literally you know all of us gathered together in front of our cameras, um, you know, and years of you know, work that everyone had put into. Yeah. Um, and the fact that the host community played such a significant role after the pandemic to kind of welcome people into their homes. Um, I think it was just a magical moment at that point of time. I think no one looked at the price 
No one looked at what we were listing, and obviously it was a big surprise when that happened. Yeah. But just the fact that we were all there together at that moment was was really magical. Got it, got it. No, that's that's super. I'm so glad we you know iterated that because a lot of that is the dreamy-eyed Indian entrepreneur who wants to get to that stage yeah. someday or the other. And we're going to see much more of that in the country. So I I'm think sure. that just reinstores belief. Yeah. Um, to very quickly end, right? I have a couple of very fast questions that I'm going to mm-hmm. ask. Let's quickly go through them. And I think this has been so much more than I'd imagined, right? Mm-hmm. This has been like an active brainstorming session oh, around it, yeah. the Airbnb model, the learnings and just scale learnings. Um, coming to you, you know, I want to ask just very quick questions. So I think one of them is, uh, this is a tricky one, hmm. but if Airbnb did not exist in an alternative world, which other startup by choice would you end up leading in the country? I think I would have started up something in the healthcare industry. Okay. About that particular area. I... You know, I'm a younger of three siblings. My elder sister is a doctor. So okay. when I was in grade one, she was going into med school. Okay. So I saw her kind of embrace You've this, seen that through childhood. You know, and, and I do believe that, you know, that is one service to humanity that is extremely important. And technology can play a huge role there. And as we see in terms of evolution. So I would have done something in the healthcare piece. Got it, got it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you had to point out maybe two to three learnings, and this is just personal because yeah. I'm a, maybe, you know, a Brian nerd, but <laughs> what are two to three very important learnings from Brian Chesky from the Airbnb leadership that you can highlight very quickly for us? I think one is uh, focus on a few other things. That okay. is very important. Um, have, you know, focus on the purpose. Uh, the fact that, you know, people work not for business metrics, not for KPIs. Uh, most people do not work for dollar signs around a company. They will work for something that they strongly believe in. And if a company is kind of made um, with that belief, with a very strong purpose, where the why matters the most than the how, I think that is very important. And we have seen that play out at Airbnb. Yeah. Um, I've also seen uh, with Brian specifically, you know, he is one of the most charismatic as well as most curious leaders out there, right? Um, one thing that I've learned personally from him, his ability to raise his hand and ask for help or consultation from an expert or someone else in some other field where he does not have knowledge of, right? So over the years, he's gone to various folks who've kind of helped him on multiple aspects, right? I mean, I think a lot of times founders tend to think that they know everything and they, you know, whatever they do, they are, they, they are the best at it. But the fact, even today when I look at India, right, so many people are trying to solve things themselves. You don't need to. You just yeah. raise your hand. There's a network that you can get access to and learn from someone else journey and I think Brian has done that very well and now he's such a big role model for so many others as well. Yeah, no, that's amazing. If I had to ask your friends to describe you, what would they say? My friends would uh, definitely describe me as someone who's extremely passionate, Mm -hmm. uh, workaholic, uh, but very curious and hopefully fun to be with. Got it. Amazing. I usually don't do prediction questions because I think those are, yeah. you know, mundane. But then yeah. you had the insight and experience of seeing the ecosystem over and over again across mm-hmm. business cycles. Five or, you know, three predictions for India next five years. I think mean, one prediction is enough. You know, there is massive momentum. Hmm. Um, we are at a very unique stage where in our lifetimes, you have an opportunity to see a country develop into something much bigger. Um, we have all the things in place in terms of You know, the economy growing, digital infrastructure, digital public infrastructure, uh, very, very strong demographic dividend that can come into play in the future. Um, I think it's our opportunity to lose now. Um, And I would say that I have only positive feelings in terms of what India could be, not just five years from now, but 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Tech will play a big role. Startups will play a big role. You know, young talent, founders and, and professionals will play a big role. But it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for people to witness so people should just enjoy the ride that's lovely every time i hear somebody you know who's a pure you know startup person talk about india with such optimism i think it just brings us a lot of joy because that is the case that and it's the, just great to be uh, to have the privilege to be a part of it oh yeah. yes definitely. Um, the last question and it's an obvious one because airbnb just changed the face of travel if you had to maybe highlight you know not uh, the travel blogger kind but the travel experience like just mm. top two three things about the travel experience that really elevated to you know 5 10x this is something that you know brand also talks about yeah. as as Airbnb, we talk, talk yeah. about the 10x experience. Yeah. What is this travel experience? I think it's about being authentic. Okay. Uh, you know, hosts on our platform bring their authentic selves. Mm-hmm. Um, they create these authentic experiences where people come and immerse themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, I've said this before, the magic is always in the people. Yeah. Nothing can replace the people to people connect. And I think the fact that people want to experience these new places through the lens of, you know, the host and live like a local, 
I think that is for me the most magical piece of travel. Uh, travel is something that people need to experience, um, and I think no better way than to experience it with a local, experience it with a family that kind of brings you into their community, you know, introduces the local culture and passion to you, and just let you be there, right? And I think that's very powerful, and that's what we see Airbnb kind of do in a very, very effective manner. Absolutely, Airbnb has changed the game, and I'm so glad we had this conversation and ending with authenticity and people. Thank yeah. you so much, Amanpreet, for being on Thank the show. You. It's been such a pleasure. I've long waited for this conversation, and it's been a pleasure talking to you off the record, and I'm glad we got this done. Uh, it's been such an amazing conversation. Well, it's Thank been you. an amazing. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.